Alex Murphy's a 1987 Robocop, the legendary character embodied by Peter Weller, trying on the costume of a futuristic knight, Peter Weller experienced what it means to be Robocop, half machine, half man. The guys are really trying hard, working their hardest. Check out my fancy robot glasses, so. What are we talking about? It takes them about an hour or an hour and a half or so to put this whole costume on me. It's Robo Water. This guy's always turning things with his screwdriver. And I have to stand like this for half an hour. Right now we'll find out what Robocop suit is made of and how it's constructed, what the, the bespectacled man with the screwdriver is up to, where the long needle comes from, where the special effects were drawn and why Robocop needs a tape puller, in short, how Peter Weller was Robocop. American actor Peter Weller, the star of the failed and 84th year sci-fi comedy, The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai in the Eighth Dimension, came to the attention of producers by chance and literally immediately liked the director Paul Verhoeven. After all, the first place was not the acting, but the size and appearance of the actor, with his damn fine chin line. Peter Weller was the perfect Robocop. I play a guy who's suddenly killed, but the doctors bring him back to life, make him a robot, turn him into a cyborg, and as time goes on, he begins to be tormented by terrible memories of the past, as he gradually realizes that he was once a normal human being, and tries to make even more sense of himself, to realize who he used to be, it's all more like a fairy tale, kind of like Beauty and the Beast, about soul searching, that's what the film is about, it's not a story about some bionic guy or some bionic girl, it's not about a living human being, with mechanical stuffing. On the contrary, it's a story about a mechanical entity, a robot with a human soul. The development of the costume began long before Peter Weller was confirmed for the role of Murphy Robocop. Producers approached Rob Botton, they liked and loved Botton's practical effects and animatronic puppets in the 1982 film, The Thing. Rob agreed and made some full-size sculptures to start with. Paul Verhoeven wanted a robot similar to the characters in the popular manga, Space Sheriff Gavin. But it was impossible to come up with anything similar and practical, the creative process took a long time. After numerous drafts, disputes and approvals, Verhoeven and Botten finally found a compromise and approved the design of steel armor of a futuristic knight. It all took a year and a half and one million dollars. The cast for the costume were made five months before filming started, I had to travel to Los Angeles with Rob Botten where they molded every part of my body perfectly. I sat there for a long time in this, this thing that they put on fractures. In a cast. I was in a cast and I sat still, and I was like, 40 minutes just on one palm, then another 40 minutes on the hand, then the whole body, then the knees, then the feet, then everything else. Peter Weller had no idea what the costume was going to be, but he took the character very seriously, bringing in the mime master Moni Yakima as his mentor, a teacher of stage movement and plasticity, when they brought the Robocop costume, after 10 hours of fitting and adjusting the elements, it became clear that the plastic slow movements of the robot, which Peter and Moni learnt and rehearsed for 6 months, nowhere good. In a bulky suit to move smoothly and gracefully is simply impossible, they had to stop filming for three days so that Peter could at least get used to the costume and figure out how to move better in it. Moni Yakim advised Peter to carefully study the acting and plastic movements of Nikolai Cherkasov as Ivan the Terrible from the 1944 film. The suit is an elasticated lining. It looks quite unusual. Like some kind of black leather. On top of which you put on the suit itself. And it looks like it's made of titanium like some kind of space-colored metal, all shimmering green and blue. And it's got this, um, pronounced structure, with a distinct muscular texture. It's a very smooth helmet. And it's got this little narrow black visor on the front that's about 5 centimeters wide, like sunglasses. The helmet covers the tip of his nose. And there's a black rubber around my chin. And it's like I'm inside this shell. It's more like Greek or Roman warrior's armor, all smooth and shiny. Only I move like a robot. The costume consists of 26 parts. It is based on a rubber jumpsuit with straps around the torso, and various fiberglass elements are put on top and fastened together. To make them shine, they were rubbed with special oil and wax compositions. 
But in reality the suit was terribly heavy, hot and uncomfortable. Yes, yes, it is. It's heavy, hot and uncomfortable. On the days we were shooting in August, it was 40 degree heat. And by the end of the day I was losing about a kilo, along with water, because I was sweating so much in the rubber suit, the tight rubber doesn't allow air to pass through, it's not restrictive, but it's still rubber. The suit is heavy, almost 18 kilos. That doesn't seem like a lot, but if you wear 18 kilos all day, when you're falling down ladders, smashing walls, dodging 45 men with Uzis trying to shoot you, it's gonna get harder. It's really hot. In addition to the parade costume, there were six others. One made of fire-resistant fiberglass for the stuntman in the petrol station explosion scene, two others with various injuries, for the fight with the DD-209 combat robot and surviving a barrage of aimed fire from the Detroit police, plus three suits in reserve, elements of which were also used in the filming. Robocop physically did not fit in a regular car, interfered two thick and voluminous legs. For him to make a large coupe on design projects Robert Webb, but this idea was quickly abandoned because the shooting and already barely fit into the budget, in addition, had to spend on several Taurus for the Detroit police. Because the company Ford did not agree to provide them on a free basis, referring to the overabundance of violence and violence in the film, one such Taurus went to Robocop. To get behind the wheel, Peter wore only the top part of the suit, dressed from the waist down in a Robocop costume, Going down the stairs in a nightclub was not easy either, you can't look under your feet and you can't see anything through the helmet. Peter was afraid of falling down and breaking something on the small narrow steps, fortunately, the scene was filmed on the third take, here, by the way, one funny cameo flashed. We will tell you about it at the end of this video. I've got an unbelievably huge gun. I don't know where they got it, but they said there's only three of them in the whole world, civilians. We had to go to the feds to get permission to use this thing. This automatic pistol magically appears out of my leg. My leg just opens up and I pull it out. And it shoots flames like a dragon. Yeah, that gun is a beast, it's a specially modified Beretta M93R. Which Robocop carries in a mechanized holster hidden in his right hip, which is a separate spring and cable-operated, remote-controlled device. Pull one cable and the hip opens, pull the other and it closes, to avoid showing the mechanism of Robocop's titanium arms, Peter wore large black rubber gloves, that's a great solution. However, it took 50 takes and a whole day of shooting for him to catch the keys, which kept bouncing off the rubber fingers. Two white things by my ears. Just, um, two things next to my ears. It's actually Robopaper. Robopaper keeps the helmet from covering my ears so I can hear everything that's going on around me. Stefan is in charge here, he's in charge. Like a foreman. And that bearded guy is in charge of the set, he makes sure everything's in order. Then there's Dennis, the head mechanic, who keeps everything in perfect condition. I mean, the guys work on the costume every day. They're always doing something, even now they're in the warehouse repairing, touching up and reassembling other suits exactly like it, as soon as they're ready. We'll use them too. But they're getting a lot of wear and tear. What the hell is going on in there? This guy's always turning things with his screwdriver. And I have to stand like this for half an hour. What the hell, man? Don't move until I'm done. He says, hold still, I'm not done. And this scene was filmed at a telephone exchange, where the Robocop inserts his switching plug, the so-called needle, not into a supercomputer, but into an ordinary telephone switchboard, of course, there was no needle up Peter's sleeve. The arm with the inbuilt pop-up needle is held by a behind-the-scenes assistant. It's ingenious and simple, the exact same trick with the arm is done when Robocop sticks the needle in Clarence Boddicker's neck. The video effects of Robocop's vision, such as program loading, targeting, voice analyzer and timer, were created on a Commodore Amiga computer, for the 80s. The Amiga had impressive graphics and sound capabilities. With its multitasking operating system and a lot of different software, it easily outdid its competitors. The Amiga's contribution to the development of the demo scene and tracker music is worth mentioning.
Robocop's armor shines and mesmerizes, the professionalism of cameraman director Jost Vacano is visible in every frame, playing with shadows, unusual angles, dynamic picture, live camera and incredibly beautiful light. When Robocop looks through the wall, it's not graphics or thermal imaging, but a dark room with the same actors painted with colored fluorescent paint. It glows perfectly in the dark and gives the right effect, it's a lot cheaper than using some sort of infrared camera. The shootout in the factory was rehearsed by Peter Weller and played to Peter Gabriel's song, Red Rain, the, his helmet hides his headphones and his player hides in a secret pocket. With music, it's wildly satisfying to shoot bandits, Peter said. To shoot one of the key scenes in an abandoned steel factory, Peter Weller arrived far past midnight, for six hours, until the morning, he had plastic makeup done and spent several more hours putting on the costume. The boys are working very hard. Working hard. It's gonna take them about an hour or an hour and a half or so to get this whole costume on me. But then in the film, when it's time, I take my helmet off my head, my helmet, and I've got this head, which was shot through and through. And then it was completely, completely computerized. And that's a whole other complicated makeup that takes four and a half hours. And that's just for the head. And then another hour for the costume, it's not easy, man. This isn't a beauty parlor, if anyone's interested. Rob Botton insisted that Peter should not be shot with harsh strong light, it was necessary to darken the environment, so as not to reveal the details of plastic makeup, Paul Verhoeven was adamant, he wanted a bright picture and stood his ground, fully trusting the cameraman director, a scandal broke out and they vowed never to work with each other again. The premiere screening of Robocop surprised everyone. It turned out so cool that the guys made up and two years later met again in the film crew of the action film, Remember Everything. Robocop was voiced by sound FX engineers Stephen Flick and John Pospishall. These creatives have got a lot of stuff going on. The timing chain for high-pitched footsteps. The whistle and rattle of a VCR tape for head, arm and leg movements. a guitar flanger pedal for voice processing. Thank you for your cooperation. Good night. Iron, synths, and a bunch of other stuff to make the sounds fatter and fuller. Notice how Robocop's sound changes throughout the film, from mechanical tones. Serve the public trust, protect the innocent, uphold the law. And as he realizes himself as a human being to a softer and more natural one. Dick Jones is wanted for murder. This is absurd! That thing is a violent mechanical psychopath! My program will not allow me to act against an officer of this company. When we were shooting the Robocop scene in a nightclub, there were a lot of people dancing. So to get the crowd excited, to loosen them up, to get them moving, I started dancing with them, setting the right rhythm and mood. And then, when I finished filming all these dancers, out of the blue, Jost, just for fun, and he points the camera at me, and I'm like, like that, yeah. I noticed me in the shot and I said, What are you gonna do about that? And he said, Nothing. It's alright. You wanted more extras, so get them. With a budget of only $13 million, the film paid for itself many times over, then came the sequel, and then the third and even the fourth part. There were TV series, cartoons, comic books, toys and computer games, Robocop became a truly cult character, and the entertainment industry earned billions of dollars on it. In 2014, Brazilian director José Padilha took a swing at the Holy and shot a remake of Verhoeven Robocop. But you can't beat the master, the 1987 Robocop, played by Peter Weller, will always remain the perfect Robocop. You know, being Robocop is great. I mean, he's, like, he's amazing, he's also different and amazing. It's probably the most challenging, but very exciting and thrilling experience of my acting career.
In addition to the strong societal morals and profound reasoning scattered throughout the plot, Robocop is intriguing for its unconventional dramatic component revolving around the character of Alex Murphy. We meet the cop during the most difficult period of his career and watch the officer's rebirth into a robot in real time. The image of the invincible robot cop created by screenwriter Edward Neumeyer and beautifully recreated by an excellent team led by the legendary Paul Verhoeven is still relevant today and is rightly considered a living classic of the genre.